My guest today is one of the greatest keyboard players of rock and roll music. Some even have called him rock and roll secret weapon. He played with the Elman Brothers on songs like Jessica and Ramblin' Man. And he has been playing with the Rolling Stones since 81 and just finished the European tour. And he played on one of my favorite records of all time, Eric Clapton's Unplugged. I would like to welcome Mr. Chuck Lavelle. Chuck, welcome. Thank you, Ed. So wonderful to be with you. Uh, uh, looking forward to talking about our Unplugged experience. And you've just finished uh, the Stones tour throughout Europe. How did it go? Well, it was great. We did have one little hiccup when uh, Mick got COVID, actually, as you well know, in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. uh, about two hours before the band was to start playing. Uh, he had woken up that morning not feeling well. The, as the day progressed, he got worse. Um, he came to the venue two hours before the show and tested positive. And um, yeah, I saw him as he was leaving, and he looked at me with sad eyes and said, Chuck, I'm so sorry. I tested negative yesterday, but I just feel horrible right now, and I just can't do it. So... It was unfortunate that we lost, uh, well, we didn't lose it. As you know, we made up the Amsterdam show. Yeah. But we did have to lose the Baron Switzerland show. Uh, we could not reschedule that. Yeah. We did tag on an extra show at the end of the tour in uh, Berlin. So other than that little hiccup, uh, the tour was absolutely amazing. Uh, the, every show was sold out, uh, averaged to 55,000 to 60,000 people a night, Uh, performances were strong. Of course, we still very much miss Charlie Watts. We think about Charlie every day. Mm -hmm. uh, but Steve Jordan has been a friend for decades, an amazing drummer, a wonderful, wonderful individual. And uh, he has stepped in and just done a marvelous, marvelous job. So at the end of the day, the tour was incredibly successful. We all enjoyed it. We'll see. Is it over now? I, I don't. I don't think so. But the band uh, is taking a break, and we'll see if there's more next year. Maybe. It feels like they are more on fire than ever, and they're enjoying it more than ever. It seems from the outside. Well, you know, Ed. I people uh, ask me sometimes, when is the Rolling Stones going to retire? Mick's 79, <laughs> and Keith is 78. He'll be 79 later this year. And my answer is, well. You know, what do you think they want to do? Go sit at home and watch TV? I mean, this is what they do. This is this is life's blood to all of us, really. And, you know, is there going to be a point where it makes sense not to do it anymore? Sure, I think that that's going to come at some point in time. But you're right. The band is, is tight. It's playing great. Mick is performing at the top of his game. Keith... Uh, you know, we all love what we do. Um, for me, it's been 40 years with the band now. Uh, I'm fortunate to be able to have a career that allows me to play with other artists. And I know we'll be talking about Eric Clapton, of course. Yeah. And uh, others that I've worked with, as you know, uh, David Gilmour, and you mentioned the Allman Brothers Band, uh, George Harrison's yeah. last tour. So, You know, I feel like I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I've got a great gig with the Stones, uh, but then I also get to follow other things as well. Yeah. Yeah, the reason that we are talking is because of the Unplugged album. It celebrates its 30th anniversary this year. The best-selling live album to date, 26 million copies were sold. How about that? Yeah, where's my royalty check? <laughs> uh, no, yeah. Um, Uh, it, it was a remarkable experience, and I know you're going to ask me some questions about mm, it, but yeah. just uh, to start things off, it was really, truly a re remarkable, unique, unbelievable uh, blessing of an experience, uh, a wonderful memory for me. I really enjoyed watching your interview with my friend Andy Fairweather Lowe. It's, it's so odd because Andy and I got to be quite close during that period of time. Uh, we spent a lot of time personally together, just having dinners and talking. Um, hmm. And I hadn't seen him since those days. So it was really Jeez. wonderful to see your interview with him. Yeah, that's nice to hear. It's nice to hear. Let's start at the <clears> beginning. <throat> how, how did you get asked for the, for the Unplugged gig? So in uh, 1989, uh, the Stones did the Steel Wheels tour. And on that tour... Eric was a special guest on, I think, about half a dozen shows. Uh, fortunately for me, they set him up physically right next to me on the stage. Uh, the song that we did was Little Red Rooster, you know, the Howlin' Wolf song. Yeah. 
And uh, so we had some nice little musical conversations back and forth. Of course, he was the special guest, and I was not about to step on his toes, but I would try to converse with him musically a little bit uh, during that song. So at the end of the tour, I get home, and there's a message on my answering machine. Hello, this is Eric Clapton calling from Hong Kong for Chuck Lavelle <laughs> to see if he might be interested in playing some shows at the Royal Albert Hall. Yeah, I'd be interested in that. Uh, so I answered. Um, he had me to come to London and rehearse with the band, and we did the 24 Nights album, which I'm sure you recall. Yeah. I played on 18 of the 24 nights uh, with Eric. Uh, especially uh, fun was the blues nights that we did, six nights of blues players with, uh, you know, Buddy Guy and and uh, just so many great blues guitarists. And yeah. also Johnny Johnson was on that. Um, and, of course, I played, <clears throat> I played organ whenever Johnny was on the piano. But anyway, that led to a relationship with Eric, um, and we we were going to take a year off, or Eric was, to spend time with his son, Connor, and we all know what happened. They had the tragic accident with Connor falling yeah. out of a building in New York, and so a call comes through to me saying, you know, Eric doesn't need to take a year off now. He, You know, this has happened in we all feel, and he feels, that he needs to work. And uh, so the next thing we did was the tour of Japan with George Harrison. Uh, that was an amazing opportunity. And of course, during this period of time I'm talking about, we had Greg Fillingaines on keyboards as well as myself. Yeah. And so at the end of the Harrison tour... Uh, Eric came to me and he said, listen, Greg has told me that uh, he wants to um, leave the band. You know, it's very amicable. Everybody's happy, but he doesn't want to travel anymore. He wants to stay at home in L.A. He wants to produce records, play on records, and and just not tour. Uh, how do you feel about that, Chuck? Do you feel like you can handle uh, the keyboards on your own, or do you think we should consider getting um, someone else to come into the band? I said, Eric, you know what? Uh, I think I'd be very pleased to have it on my own. So he agreed, and the next thing we did was indeed the Unplugged Project. So as you can imagine, with all of this uh, having gone down, I was a little bit like a coiled-up spring ready to oh, yeah. to cut loose. Uh, you know, Greg is a good friend and an amazing player. And by the way, we tag-teamed again with the David Gilmore tour in oh, wow. 2016. But, uh, but this gave me a chance to, you know, have more space myself as a player uh, with Eric's band. And yeah. the next step was indeed Unplugged. The weeks or days leading up to the concert, what do you remember of that specific period? For instance, uh, what kind of things come to mind when you think about rehearsals? Well, uh, as Andy told you in his interview, the rehearsals were at Bray Studios in London. Um, uh, also, as you uh, talked with Andy, there was some pre-rehearsal with just Andy and Eric at Eric's house yeah. uh, to kind of come up with some ideas and experiment with some things. And then when we all gathered at Bray to begin the official rehearsals, I remember one of the first things that uh, Andy told me, because I knew he he had been working with Eric, Andy said, hey, man, wait, wait till you hear the version of Layla. It's a shuffle. <laughs> <You know? laughs> He's, I said, well, I'm trying to imagine how that would be, but okay. So... Um, you know, we started, I can't remember the exact order of what songs we did, but uh, I thought Eric had a really good vision for how he wanted to do the unplugged setting. Um, I think he was inspired by watching the Hall & Oates version of Unplugged, where yeah. they did a version of a Beatles song. Uh, I think it was, uh, was it Don't Let Me Down? Don't or, Let Me Down, or, yeah. It was, yeah. yeah, okay. And that triggered Eric's thoughts about 
uh, hey, I can do renditions. You know, I, I don't have to just do acoustic versions of the original versions of the songs that I've done on records. I can do something very different, you know. And I think then he came up with the idea of uh, doing a lot of the blues numbers, like Nobody Knows You When You're yeah. Down and Out and Alberta, Alberta, uh, Malted Milk, uh, and, and so forth. But then he could rearrange Layla and he could rearrange these other songs, uh, Tears in Heaven, uh, which, which really translated well into acoustic setting. And, and so, uh, you know, first of all, he had to have a vision for how he wanted to do it. And that vision became apparent during the early parts of the rehearsals. And the rest of us were simply following uh, his direction, you know, yeah. uh, and finding our own ways to contribute. You know, that, that was yeah. what was going through my mind was, uh, first of all, you've got a great opportunity here because now you're the only keyboard player in Eric Clapton's band. Yeah. Uh, that was first and foremost on my mind. And the second thing was now, how do you take advantage of that? How do you contribute musically to these songs that he's bringing to the table? So um, it, it, the most thing that I was doing uh, was listening, you know, listening yeah. to... Eric, listening to the whole band and listening to how can I fit into this and contribute as best as possible. Yeah, and the rest of the musicians, I think you had a history with a couple of them? Well, yes, you know, going back to the fact that Greg uh, Fillingaines was on the 24 Nights and on the George Harrison tour, uh, you know, we all fit in together so beautifully and Greg and I became very, very close friends. Uh, I mentioned my friendship with Andy. Uh, Steve Ferroni uh, was a, another person that I spent a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, personal time with. Uh, Katie and Tessa were beautiful singers. Ray Cooper, an amazing percussionist. Yeah. Um, but again, I would emphasize to you that during that era, there were two keyboard players. There was Greg and myself. So when mm -hmm. we got to Unplugged, It was a different situation, you know. There was there was only me on keyboards, and that was the big difference, um, you know. And uh, Greg had, I think, made a good decision for himself. You know, he had been with Eric for a long time at yeah. that point in time. You know, I think probably six years or something, and he was ready for a change. And um, and I was ready, quite frankly, to step up uh, my game with the band. I had already made friends with all of them. It was very comfortable. We were all very happy playing with each other. There was a lot of laughter, a lot of fun. And, you know, there was sometimes, as there is with any band, there was some tension here and there. Mm -hmm. But uh, mostly it was like, wow, you know, we get to do this. Yeah. Like going back to the George Harrison tour, are you kidding? I get to play uh, 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 the, uh, um, the harpsichord on Piggies, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get yeah. to play... A piano on While My Guitar Gently Weeps. I mean, th yeah. this was an extraordinary tour and uh, a great opportunity. But, you know, it, it was an evolution. Uh, again, knowing that 24 Nights was my first uh, gig with Eric. Second thing was George Harrison. Now we're at Unplugged. And then, you know, going past Unplugged, we did a tour with the electric band where I was still the only keyboard player. Hmm. But... Um, Unplugged was the first, again, I was kind of like a coiled up spring, ready yeah. to, to jump out, ready to do these solos, ready to have a larger role with the band, uh, but also having a wonderful relationship with everyone that was, uh, that was in Eric's yeah. band, and with Eric. And with Eric himself. And what do you remember of the day of the recording? How, what was the vibe like? You, you must have been working towards that, that moment of like where the, the, the people came in into Brave uh, Studios. Was it like a relaxed vibe or was it a little bit tense? How was the atmosphere? Well, first of all, <clears throat> as you'll recall, it was a relatively small audience. Uh, they were selected, I think, by you know some kind of uh, lottery or something. Uh, yeah. So they were very fortunate and very happy to be there. And I can't remember the exact number, but maybe 200, 250 or 300 people or so. It was a small audience. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the stage was set. Uh, the audience were in their place. The cameras were all set. Um, I was quite relaxed. 
I think everyone was uh, feeling confident. Eric was quite nervous, and I sensed it, you know, uh, before we were going on. This was a, you know, it's his band, it's his name, uh, it's his responsibility. Uh, yeah. Whatever happens, it's on him. Yeah. And so I think he felt that, and, and he was uh, confident. You know, Eric's a confident guy, but but he was also, there was some tension and nervousness that I sensed in him before we walked on stage. But I think as we started, well, of course, as, as you know, there was a couple of songs that he played where I, I was still off stage. Um, Signy, the little song he wrote, um, acoustic yeah. instrumental, Malted Milk, I think, and maybe there was something else I can't quite recall. But uh, then finally, when I got to join, and quite honestly, I felt very calm. Uh, I was excited to have that, you know, uh, have the keyboard roll to myself. Uh, I was uh, overjoyed to play with these wonderful musicians, wonderful individuals, Steve, and we've already mentioned everybody. Nathan East, I didn't mention Nathan. Nathan is a... Uh, magical musician and a wonderful oh, yeah. human being. So you know that was that was the feeling, and I think by uh, the third, fourth tune, Eric had settled in, uh, and and you know I I would like to think he was being supported well by all of us, and I think oh, yeah. perhaps we gave him a foundation for him to feel more comfortable on, and then from there it just turned into a very magical night. And what I really like when looking at the, uh, the, the, the recordings that are on YouTube, uh, you can see like in the beginning, there's like this, he's a little bit tense, I think. And he was still smoking on stage, right? At that point. Yes. That was still yes. allowed back then. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I was so pleased, Ed, when he quit smoking uh, years later. You know, uh, we all worried about his health and anybody that smokes cigarettes. Uh, it, it, mm, yeah. It's not a good thing for people to do. But, uh, no. yes, he was. I remember him uh, uh, grabbing for that uh, cigarette package a few times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and did you think, I talked to that, uh, about that with Andy, like in the rehearsal tapes that are also on, on YouTube for everyone to watch. Um, there's an alternate version of Layla and the beginning and the solo are totally different. And then the moment, the, the moment supreme, as they say in French, and he nails it. Do you think like where that extra bit of tension brings out the best in a musician? Well, it's a good point. Um, you know, I think that can happen because you're on edge and, and you know, it's like you're at the at the edge of the cliff. Uh, do you keep your balance or do you fall off? And uh, fortunately, everybody kept their balance, <laughs> especially Eric. Uh, yeah. So uh, nobody fell off the cliff, fortunately. Were there any songs that didn't uh, make the record that were practiced? Like some blues classics or did you have like extra songs that didn't make the recording? Well, Ed, it was a long time ago, <laughs> and uh, I, I honestly can't recall it, with the exception of telling you about Old Love, because uh, we had rehearsed Old Love, and he had discarded it, you know, saying, I, I don't know if he felt like it was one slow song too many, or that it just wasn't fitting for whatever reason, um, but uh, during the rehearsal period after we rehearsed it, you know, he discarded it. And um, it, what happened, if you want to hear the story, is that yes, yeah, sure. Uh, we had done all the we, we we had done all the complete set. We had done the encores that we had uh, planned, and the audience still wanted more, and everybody was excited. And I don't know why Eric turned my way, but he did. He turned to me and he said, "What can we do?" I said, "Eric, do old love." And so without saying anything else, he started the song, and there we were. Oh, serious? And uh, I was really pleased because that offers a really nice section for a piano solo. And uh, oh, yeah. when that came around, I was, I was very happy to be the person sitting in that chair. It's, it's an amazing song. It's, I really felt first his solo and then your solo was uh, I, I think I, I read somewhere that his solo was totally improvised. What, I think your solo w was too, or was it like 
segments were se improvised, or how did it go? Well, when you get back to the uh, standing on the edge of the cliff, uh, that was certainly me on my solo, because as I said, we had uh, discarded the song. We rehearsed it once, and then and then Eric said, you know, I don't think it's going to be on the show. So when at the end of the show, uh, Eric turned to me and, and said, what can we do? And I said, old love. And we started it. It was like, well, uh-oh, here we are. You know, uh, <laughs> we, we better be on our toes here. But yeah, it, it, all the solos, no matter what the song, were were totally improvised. Um, you know, there were, Eric is an a, an incredible uh, artist of improvisations. Mm, yeah. You know, I've, I don't. In my years with Eric, and in my years hearing him play with with other bands, I've never heard a wrong or a bad note from that guy. Uh, you know, mean. I'll I'll slip occasionally and play something that you know that I that I shouldn't have, <laughs> but I've never heard Eric do that. It's it's really remarkable. He's just so on yeah. top of his game, and uh, but you know, the, the, all the solos that night uh, for me in particular, I remember Alberta, Alberta, and I'll give you another quick little story if you oh, want yeah. to hear it about Alberta. Yeah, sure. At the end of the song, at the end of the song, Alberta, as you know, he calls my name out in his yeah. English accent, Chuck Lavelle, and they kept it on the on the record. I couldn't believe it. You know, wow, Eric's calling my name, and it's on the record. <laughs> yeah. How cool is that? Well, before we. You know, we, we finished the album, the album came out, and we were going to tour, but there was a gap before we went out to tour. So I went home, and uh, as you probably know, my other life is that I'm an environmentalist, I'm yep. very, uh, I'm a forester, uh, and so there was a little media tour being set up for me to go talk about trees and the environment. And I was on the phone to this woman that was setting it up. And she said, listen, before we talk about that, I just want you to know, I just got the unplugged record and, and it's unbelievable. I just love it. And I said, well, what an honor it was for me to be there. And thank you very much. And she said, you know, that uh, song, Alberta, Alberta, and he calls your name out at the end of that. I said, yeah. She said, well, I think that's really cool, but I want to tell you that my son really loves that part. That's the favorite part of his record. I said, well, how old is your son? And she said, uh, he's six. And I said, well, wait a minute. Why, why would a six-year-old boy get excited when he hears Chuck Lavelle? And she said, because he thinks, Eric says, chocolate milk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an amazing story. Once you hear it, you will never not hear it from this point on. Yeah. It cannot be unheard. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. No. <laughs> um, also, about the old love solo, what I really find great when you look at the, the recording, you are in the middle of the solo, almost at the end of the solo, and you do this magical run, and you see Eric and Andy look at, you, look at each other like, whoa. What is Chuck doing? That's one of my favorite moments of the old, old record. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, it was, uh, you know, <clears throat> a great compliment to me to see the expressions on their face. And again, you know, remembering that this was my first time that I'm the only keyboard player. And so they yeah. had never really heard me do a solo like that. No. And, uh, and so it, it was very pleasing to, to see their expressions. Did you think, in 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 total, that the album would be a, the big success that it eventually turned out to be, or how how did you walk away from from the session? We were uh, obviously very happy with the performance. Um, I thought the camera angles were very good. The setup, the small audience, I thought was made it very very special without having, you know being in an arena or something. Uh, but did we think it was going to be a huge hit? No, you know, nobody knew for sure. Uh, we felt like it was a great performance in a very unique setting. Uh, but the next step was to go out and and do a electric tour. You know, to go back out yeah. for Eric with the with the band, uh, the same band as Unplugged, but this time with you know all the electronic instruments. And and so as this album was released 
and you heard that version of Layla, uh, you know, on the radio, and it started getting a lot of play, and then we would look at the Billboard uh, charts and see the unplugged name. This week it's here, and next week it's rising up to, you know, number uh, 18 or whatever it was, and then the next week it's rising up to 10, and then it just goes up and up and up, and the sales are off the charts. Uh, you know, dog, doggone it, I wish some of us uh, had a piece of that royalty, because like you said, yeah. 25 million records. So, uh, Man. Uh, but... But you know, we were we were all just very very happy to be involved in the project. Uh, this it's, it was a good feeling to have our names uh, as on the credits for that. Uh, the fact that it was a video as well as an, a record. Uh, so we were surprised. I was surprised. I'm not sure how the rest of the folks felt, you know. But it, I can tell you, it was quite a wonderful feeling to see that it, it, week after week to just be more and more recognized and uh yeah and the dvd selling so very well and of course they ran it multiple times on mtv so yeah it was a lot of exposure yeah yeah and are there any other songs that that you have like great memories about the other one that stands out really is uh the version of layla to me uh, yeah. because i didn't have a, a proper solo in the song but i got to do a lot of fills you know, behind Eric's vocal, uh, in, in, and it was such a different version, as we know, than the, the hard-driving electric original version with Dwayne Allman and, and uh, Derek and the Dominoes. And uh, so that that was fun for me to play, uh, fun for me to find a, a part that would, you know, uh, give the piano a, a nice role uh, in the body of the song. And of course, we didn't do the reprise at the end that uh, Jim Gordon did, but uh, but it was unnecessary. Did you guys with that try version, that reprise? So. Did Did you even try that to incorporate it? No, no, because it was such. Uh, it would have not really fit. It would it would not have been appropriate, in my opinion. No. Because what makes it work is the contrast. You know, yeah. the contrast of having the up tempo Layla and all the great guitar, and then all of a sudden it calms down. You know, yeah. that's really what makes that work. And because this version of Layla was already laid back, and it, it would have been too much the same, I think. Yeah. Otherwise, you had to speed it up or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, uh, that one for me was when you ask which ones stand out. That was uh, that was a nice moment. Okay. I think I have everything I needed to know about the session and and everything. Um, Yeah, yeah, it's, it was it was great talking to you, Chuck. <laughs> yeah, a real pleasure, and I, I think it's so special that you want to do this, that you want to go out uh, on your tour, and and you know give this uh, project another bit of exposure. Uh, it's hard to believe it was 30 years ago, man. Yeah, uh, but then it's hard <laughs> to believe that I've been with the Rolling Stones for 40 years. Yeah, uh, yeah that's so. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. it, But but let me just say that these are wonderful landmarks. You know, the 30th anniversary of Unplugged is a, a very special landmark. And thank you for wanting to do this project uh, to celebrate the uh, album and to go out and play it on your own. I think it's beautiful. So thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's like Clapton, like Eric Clapton did with his heroes. I'm now doing it with mine. So it's let's pass on the music, you know, that's because... Uh, thing is, a couple of weeks ago, Clapton played in Holland in the Ziggo Dome. And I went to his concert with my girlfriend. And we have two children, so there was like someone watching over our, our children. And she's a young girl, 18 years old. So I said, I'm going to see Eric Clapton. And she's like, who? And I'm like, what? I don't know <laughs> Eric Clapton. What? <laughs> what is this? So it's it's necessary to to play this music, to play these songs, to to keep telling about the great music from the past and try to motivate young people to play guitar, piano, sing, whatever. So that's part of the, the process. Well, I, I love that. It, it's a great story. And you're right. You know, so many young people, um, or some are and some are not in tune with uh, the music that, you know, of our era, shall we say. Yeah. And uh, it's just a great, I'll, I'll just end by saying this. Uh, 
it's a wonderful feeling to do a project that stands the test of time. Uh, 30 years is a long time. And the fact that uh, the project of the record, the music is still talked about, is still celebrated and uh, still played and still heard, it's a very special feeling to have been a part of it. Thank you, Chuck. Okay, Ed, thank you. Good luck with everything, my friend. Thank you all for kijken. Ik ben heel erg benieuwd wat je van deze aflevering vond. Dus laat me dat weten in de comments. En als je hier voor het eerst bent, vergeet niet te abonneren. En druk op dat belletje, want dan ben je namelijk altijd als eerste op de hoogte als er weer een nieuwe aflevering online komt. Dankjewel.